Good evening, everyone. It's your girl, Marcy Thomas, founder of Brown Girl Collective and the BGC Book Club. And I am super excited to be here with you for our last author interview of 2022. How exciting is that? So come on in the room and just let us know where you're joining us from if you would like, or if this is your first time, please share that in the comments. As a means of introduction of myself, I've already given you my name and I started BGC Book Club a couple of years ago, actually during the pandemic, as a way to share my love of books and reading, especially those books by, for, and about Black women. So this is a space that I have had the pleasure of interviewing countless authors over the last couple of years. And I'm super duper excited about this last one for this year. So the book that we're going to be talking about is Weightless, Making Space for My Resilient Body and Soul by Yvette Dion. So by means of introduction, let me tell you a little bit about her. Yvette Dion is a journalist, an editor, and a pop culture critic. She is the National Book Award nominated author of Lifting As We Climb, Black Women's Battles for the ba Battle for the Ballot Box, a middle grade nonfiction book about Black women's suffragists. Her work has appeared in Glamour, Cosmopolitan, Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Teen Bow, among other publications. She is a graduate of Bennett College, based in Denver, Colorado, where she works as the executive editor of Yes Media. And without any further delay, let's welcome Yvette Dion to the BGC Book Club. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here. Yes, and you already have a comment, one of your Bennett sisters. <laughs> Hi, Bennett sister. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Hi, so it's, I'm super excited to have you here and congratulations. Your book just came out a week ago, actually. It did. It's been so a long so Yes. It like, could have been a month ago, but yes. Right. I can imagine, you know, as you were telling me, and I call it the brown room, you've been busy. <laughs> just a lot of promotion and things like that. So for those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet or are unfamiliar with the title, just give us a little idea of what the book is about. Yes. So Weightless is a collection of essays about my life um, that thinks about the relationship between size and race and gender, and it uses pop culture. So the television shows we watch, the books we read, the movies that we consume, the music that we consume, to really make this argument that the world that we inhabit could be better for Black women, and especially fat Black women, than the world that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And it definitely does a good job of that, as we were talking before. There are just so many things in the book that resonated with me, either from experiences that I have had personally or just things that I have observed. So I really can appreciate you taking the time to share your stories. But also, because you are a journalist, you also inject some facts and things like that along with it. So it's not just necessarily always an opinion. It's things that are actually based on things that have been researched. Exactly. So a lot of what I wanted to do, I knew that people were going to come to the book because of my own personal experience. So I've been very open and honest and public about my um, struggle with both heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. I was open about freezing my eggs. I was open about my fibroid journey because I realized that there were far too many Black women who were dealing with this, but dealing with it in silence. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stigma and a lot of shame around it. So I knew that people would come to the book because of my personal experience, but I didn't want to pigeonhole them there. I really wanted to introduce them to kind of a chorus of voices of people who've experienced similar things and then also back it up with research. So it's not just my personal opinion and my personal experience, but really something that's universal that a lot of people are dealing with. Mm-hmm. And that is one thing. Well, that's kind of where we can start. As you mentioned, you've had some of your own physical challenges, health challenges over the years, and you are as a relatively young woman. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm 33. I was diagnosed with heart failure when I was 29, and I was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension when I was 30. But I had been experiencing the symptoms for many years, at least I would say at least three to four years um, I have been experiencing the symptoms, particularly of, of heart failure. So like this pooling of fluid in my ankles and in my abdomen, I was exhausted all the time, like supremely tired, couldn't get out of bed, never had enough energy to really get through the day. 
I was losing my breath. Like I would walk up a, a flight of stairs and lose my breath. And so I knew that there was something wrong. Like my body felt different and I didn't feel as well as I thought that I should have felt. Um, but I couldn't get any, any backing from doctors to figure out what was going on. Like they weren't curious about what was going on. It was essentially like you're fat. You're, you're a fat person, you lose weight, you'll feel better without considering any of my other symptoms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is unfortunate that a lot of people deal with that. You know, I'm thinking something simple. I thought about it as I was preparing, you know, for example, if you go in to the doctor and one of the first things they want to do is check your weight. And then like for me personally, there's times when I've gone to check my weight. And then a few minutes later, they check my blood pressure. My blood pressure might be elevated, but it's probably elevated because of whatever comments you may make about my weight in that moment, because under normal circumstances, it's not high. So things like that and just the bias that many doctors um, and medical professionals do have against a person just because of their weight. Yeah, it's it's actually quite unfortunate. So I include stories in the book. There's one woman who was diagnosed with stage four cancer. She ended up dying not long after her diagnosis, but she too had been going to the doctor for a long time and saying something's wrong and they were dismissing her. Or there's another uh, woman in my book who was having problems with her lungs and she went to multiple doctors saying I'm having problems. She actually ended up having a tumor in one of her lungs. She had to have half of her lung removed, but they didn't believe her for years because she was fat. And so it was just a common, common experience. And you couple that with the racial element, like being a black woman who is fat. And it just takes it to an, an entirely new realm. Like one of the examples I use in my book that I, I think about all the time is Serena Williams. I think about Serena Williams all the time that she had blood clots. She had a history of blood clots. After she gave birth to her daughter, she told her nurse like, hey, I think I'm experiencing a recurrence of blood clots. And they did not believe her. Mm -hmm. And if they're unwilling to believe Serena Williams, I don't think any other black woman really stands a chance in our system. That is so true. You know, and I'm, I'm very unfortunate. The other thing that I think of, they think that we have a higher tolerance for pain, which yes. stems back to periods of enslavement that they can do whatever, whatever we're going through. It can't be that bad because you have this high tolerance for pain. Yeah, there are literal studies of, of doctors that they've surveyed doctors and they genuinely believe that black women have a higher pain, that black people have a higher pain tolerance. So when you're going to the doctor saying, oh, my stomach's hurting, my legs are hurting, they're less willing to prescribe you pain medication because they think that you're faking it. Mm. And that's really unfortunate. Very. Another thing, and in your case with over time, you've over the years, you've had different things go on, even earlier in childhood, where you were put on some medication that created some of the issues as well. Yeah, so I was diagnosed with asthma when I was about eight years old. And prior to that, I never had uh, what they consider a weight problem. I was considered a, a normal size child. And then because my asthma was pretty progressive, so I was um, diagnosed first with bronchitis, then they said it was asthma. I was hospitalized multiple times, five days, seven days, eight days, 10 days, trying to treat it. They finally figured out that they would need to put me on a long-term steroid. So the steroid they prescribed me for asthma at that time is prednisone. And they prescribe prednisone for all sorts of things. They recently prescribed me prednisone over the summer because I, I got um, stung by a bee. Wow. And it wasn't like the infection had started to spread. So they prescribed me, prescribed me prednisone. So they prescribe it for all sorts of things. But in my young body, it caused me to gain weight. And that's when the quote unquote weight problem began when I was around nine years old. Mm, which that also brings up, and you mentioned in the book, and ironically, I heard someone else talk about this um, recently in her book, Big Girl, um, that, yeah. yes, <laughs> Mika's book about um, being a big girl, but the fact that even like Weight Watchers, that they're targeting children. Yeah, I was I was very intentional at that very first chapter in the book after the introduction to focus on what it's like to be a fat child, because there isn't there aren't a lot of stories about what it's like to navigate the world being told very early that there's something wrong with your body, that you need to lose weight, you're too big as a child, like you don't even really have 
the knowledge base to understand what's going on. And so given that information, the fact that Weight Watchers, which is now rebranded, they've called themselves WW, created an app that was targeted toward young children. So young children and preteens tells you all you really need to know about where we are as a society, that even when you're that young, they're encouraging children to think about the size of their bodies, to think about their weight. Yes, that and it comes from families as well. A lot of times, you know, a family member, oh, you're getting too fat. Oh, you need to put that down. That's what it's like to be a black girl. Honestly, I think I think a lot of young black people have had that experience of you don't need to have a second serving. Why are you eating that? You need to have some water. Don't drink any more soda today. Like very trying to control what young people are consuming. So it's more about the control element. And there's not a lot of curiosity about why is this child, which is what I try to encourage in the book, is why is this child going for ice cream instead of celery? or whatever, however you want to frame it, or why is this child withdrawn? Instead of asking questions out of a place of curiosity, our society encourages us to really surveil children. So from the school to the doctor, so at schools, children are being weighed, and if their body mass index is above a certain number at a certain age, like they're referring it to their doctor, to have an intervention with the parents, like it starts so early, and the consequences of that, of that is that then those children don't believe that their bodies belong to them. Them, which was my experience. Hmm. So at that age to think that your body doesn't belong to you because of your size, that's, that's something. Because as young Black girls, we you can deal with that in terms of your weight, but then we also know that we deal with that in other ways as well that you also talk about just by perhaps because we may mature a little bit faster. And people right. begin to tag us or, you know, have comments or, you know, things to say about who we are or what we should look like or how we should present ourselves in our bodies because of the way that we, ways in which we may be maturing. Absolutely. So there is a study, and I wasn't able to include it in the book, but that says that young Black girls go through a process of called adultification, where they're treated as if they're older than they are from the age of five. And that carries throughout our lives. So my experience was because of the prednisone, I developed really, really early. I got my first menstrual cycle when I was 10. I was in a C-cup bra, like my body looked grown, but I was actually still a child. And so what I encountered was, you know, people harassing me, people saying things about my body, boys touching my body without my permission and trying to to reinforce this idea that my body was really public spectacle. Like it wasn't my body for myself. It belonged to everyone. And that happened from school to the doctor's office to everywhere that I existed. It was happening in every way. Mm -hmm. What things do you think that, you know, just as a thought, because these are things that you've experienced, what can we do as adults, whether it's an educator or the children in our family or you know, our, our own children, what things can we do to make sure that we're listening to and really paying attention to what is going on with the children in our lives? Oh, that's an excellent question. It really is intentional listening. I'm always listening. I have two nieces now. They are 10 and 12. And I'm always listening for what they're not saying. Like I'm hearing what it is that they're saying on the on the surface, but I'm also listening for what they're not saying. And then I always ask them follow-up questions. So if they say, if I ask them how was school and they say school was good, I'm going to keep poking at that mm -hmm. to figure out like what exactly happened in your day? What did you encounter? Who did you see? What did you learn? So I'm getting a fuller picture of what's happening. So I think that's one part of it. I think another part is really not focusing on a child's body. Like mm -hmm. there's there's no reason to, to make a comment about how much weight they've gained or how much they've lost, but really focusing on them as whole people and not just thinking about how their bodies are developing. I think that that's really important. And then reinforcing to them that they are fine the way that they are. They get so many messages, especially now. I was fortunate, this was happening to me, but I was fortunate to grow up in the time before social media. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the pressures that children today have. So really trying to limit how much exposure they have outside of, of your small circle, like limiting how big the world is for them. Like social media makes you feel like you have the whole world at your hands. So really limiting how big the world is for them and reinforcing to them there's nothing wrong with them is really, really, really important. 
Right. And another thing that just came up to me, thinking not, like I said, not focusing on their body so much, not focusing on their beauty so much. I mean, yes, it's imp everybody wants to feel attractive, but when they're young, that's not the most important thing. <laughs> right. That's right. Encourage yeah. them. Talk to them about the things that they're interested in. Uh, pursue their hobbies and their interests and like encourage them in other ways. It's great to tell them like you look beautiful. I really like your outfit like that. That's an important thing to do, especially with with young girls. But outside of that, it really is reinforcing like what are your interests? How mm -hmm. can I encourage you? How can I show up for you? That's uber important for young people, especially young black girls. Mm hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your, your words of wisdom in that regard. Um, but just thinking about imagery, imagery is something like, I, I'm older than you. Yeah. <laughs> I can, you could be my daughter. I'm 56, actually. <laughs> and I grew up in a time where, you know, like Ebony and Essence magazines were really popular. And I had the opportunity to see a lot of beautiful images of black women but the reality of it is if i think about it they generally were women that you know had a certain look that they may have been different shades and different types of hair but they still tended to be thinner women and then when we were or even at my age when i was exposed to women who might have been larger they were as you talk about in your book either they're you know the sidekick or you know the butt of a joke or something like that. And you weren't really seeing well-formed, fully uh, actualized women who may have looked differently until later on. And there's a particular character that you met, mentioned that was one of the first that I can recall seeing who did have a full life. And that is Khadija James. Khadija James. <laughs> yeah, Khadija James played by Queen Latifah on Living Single. I say all the times, like my possibility model, like I wanted to be Khadija James. I really did. I wanted to be a magazine editor and live in this brownstone in Brooklyn with my three best friends or two best friends and a neighbor <laughs> and, and like really live that life. And the reason for that was that she was a fully fleshed out self-actualized character. She had relationships, she had conflict, she had really good friendships. She was struggling sometimes at work. Like she was a full on human being and it was never about her weight. Mm -hmm. Like she dated some of the finest people that they brought on that show. Yes. Right. Like Scooter and Morris Chestnut was their neighbor and, and all of these men were in her orbit and it was never about her weight. Like she just oozed confidence. And that was so important for me to see as a young person watching that show, when on the outside, I'm, I'm facing all of this um, at, uh, animosity about the size of my body, to see someone on television who wasn't encountering that at all was revolutionary for me. Absolutely was for a lot of us to see that. And unfortunately, we still don't see enough of it. <laughs> we still right. do not see enough of it, but that was an important character. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there were other characterizations where maybe it wasn't as positive. And what type right. of impact did that have on you? Right. Um, so, so the way that I frame it in the book is that there are these stereotypes that they try to lump fat black women in particular into in pop culture. So you do have the funny sidekick who's only there as like comedic relief. You do have um, kind of the caretaking black woman. I think mm -hmm. of the character that Nell Carter played on Give Me a Break, mm -hmm. who you never really see her have relationships outside of caring for this family. And I grew up on that show. I love that show. I used to watch it every morning. And also growing up seeing that, reinforced for me like that is what that's what fat black women do we don't have relationships we don't have friends like everything revolves around the people that we're caring for so i saw a lot of that in pop culture and then you have the character who like loses a lot of weight and then decides to to enact revenge or they have to lose a lot of weight in order to fit in i saw that often as well so I think it was it was really a balance for me between Khadija James being this like really empowering character and then coming up against these other characters who weren't quite that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is something to 
think about that because when you were before you even said Nell Carter, I was thinking, yeah, Nell Carter, you know, mm -hmm. give me a break, and other characters like that, and it goes back to the whole thing of, of Mammy and being a caregiver, of not being sexual, of not being attractive, and all those sorts of things, which later on, you know played out for you when you got to this age and stage where you wanted to start dating and going into different environments and looking at that and perhaps having yourself or other friends being mischaracterized because of that. Yeah, it took me a long time to recognize when I was dating that I didn't just have to accept what was given to me, mm -hmm. that I didn't have to just settle for the people that I was encountering that I got to have choices too. And that I didn't have to just say, well, at least they like me. At least they wanna be with me. So I'm just gonna put up with mistreatment. It took me a long time to get to that place. And it really started showing up for me. I didn't even realize I was carrying that baggage until I was in college and like getting into my first real adult relationships. It wasn't until that point that I realized I was even carrying that type of baggage. I just assumed I escaped it to be honest. And then I'm going to be intimate for the first time. And like, I'm just frozen. Like I want to keep my shirt on, which I did for a very long time. I was always questioning in my mind, like, does this person actually like me mm -hmm. or do they only like me because I'm doing this for them? It was, it was a constant push and a pull in trying to be in relationships with people. And so I had to go and heal that for myself and like, face that head on and challenge it head on and really try to heal it and get to the other side of it so that I could be in partnerships that were serving. Like I'm, we're, we're in service to each other. We're growing together. We're caring for each other, but it took me a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. And as you're talking about that, I have to think about myself growing up. I wasn't necessarily, you know, an overweight girl, but I, I'm 5'11". So I was always tall. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yep, yep. And, you know, and kids find reasons to pick on you. You know, I, I have my, I've had surgery, so my eyes are fine. I wore glasses. I mean, all the things. I wasn't athletic, you know, like you talk about being in the book about not being able to climb ropes. I never had the upper body <laughs> strength. You know, certain things I just couldn't do. I was, you know, as you can see, I love books, still love books, more right. geeky and all those sort of things, you know, at that time, more geeky, I guess you could say. And I went through a similar thing of, you know, at a certain point, you're just glad that somebody likes you. <laughs> right. Like, you <laughs> like me? Like me? <laughs> Not realizing that they may not like you for the right reasons, but you're just happy, you know, to have someone show you attention and, you know, you know, want to be with you or, or act like they want to be with you and things like that. So it can happen for a lot of different reasons. So I would say even those who are raising girls specifically as well, just be on the lookout for that. And, you know, things that you can encourage your girls or your daughters, the women or young girls and sometimes young women in your lives to understand that they have value and that they don't have to just take whatever <laughs> that That's comes right. their way. That's right. You're entitled to have values and to have morals and to have priorities of what you want in a partner. And if someone doesn't stack up, it's okay to say bye to them and move forward with your life. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Another thing that you introduce, I'm going to bring it up in that regard, I'm looking at the actual term that you called it, being an impermanent prototype. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, that was one of the hardest chapters I've ever read. Really? I was like writing it in heartbreak. Okay. Writing okay. It. Um, but I, I think of the prototype as the the when you're when you're on the floor of a store and you see like a refrigerator the one that they sit out is the prototype of this is the one that they experiment on they make sure that it works well like they're figuring out what they can do to it and how far it can go but the actual one that you get is like the actual what it is that you're supposed to have that's how i felt as a person mm. of when i was encountering especially once i became older and really was getting into my first real adult relationships and figuring out what it is that I wanted from a partner and what they wanted from me. What I kept finding was um, meeting people who were very upfront about how much they admired different qualities about me. Oh, you're so pretty. You're so smart. You're so ambitious. But when it came time to form an actual relationship, so to take it out of the casual realm and like come together and be together, 
it was always like this backing off. Or they wanted to date me in private because I'm a plus size girl. So they were fine being intimate with me in private with us together. But when it came time to take me out in public, go on dates, bring me around their friends, there was this deep hesitation to do so. Mm-hmm. And so for a long time, I felt like I just wasn't good enough, to be honest. I felt for a long time like I'm just not good enough to have a partner who cares about me, who loves me, who wants to love me in public and love me out loud. And I carry that around for a very long time. And I frame it as being the prototype, but people use all sorts of of language around that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is something because sometimes it feels that way. A lot of women have experienced that for different reasons. Well, yeah, you're you're good for you know whatever it is they think that you're good for, but when it comes time to decide to settle down or to marry or whatever, different people are getting chosen. But what I love that even through going through that is that you took the time to really find love within yourself. I did. It was the only way, to be honest. I was tired of after a relationship I had been in for a long time that I write about in the book, um, I was tired of looking for other people to validate me, to feel like I was only valuable when I was in a relationship, to really center my whole life around the person that I was with. It's so funny to me now because I remember asking myself then, like, why why is nothing working for me Hmm. in my life? And the reality was it couldn't because all of my energy was being directed into someone else. There Mm. was no energy for myself to take care of myself, to show up for myself, to decide what I wanted. And so it was essential for me to be single for a long time and to really go through that process of putting myself first, figuring out what I wanted. So by the time I wanted to be back in romantic relationships, I was very clear and I could bring that in with me. And I love it. That, yeah. that that's really powerful. That's really powerful to be able to do that because some people have a fear of being alone. They have a fear of, you know, digging deeper and doing the self work. They don't really want to, you know, face who they are and it's easier to look at someone else and what they did or didn't do or or aren't doing but not to look at yourself and see where maybe you need to make an adjustment. And it has nothing to do with what you look like. It has to do mm-hmm. with what's happening up here. Yeah, and in the heart. In the heart, absolutely. And learning okay. to... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I'm saying learning to fall in love with yourself. That's just critical. It's so critical. And I don't think women, especially Black women, are encouraged to do that, to mm-hmm. be honest. Like we, and within our communities, are taught to be sacrificing. We sacrifice all for the collective, for the communal. And if you try to prioritize yourself, it's selfish. But in actuality, like what I've learned is I can't be good to all of these people who are counting on me and relying on me when I'm not good to myself. It's just not possible. You're not going to get the best event you can get if I'm not taking care of me and not showing up for me and pouring into myself. So I am very open about putting myself first. And the people who appreciate that and respect that are the people who are in my life. That's right. We have a comment. Beautiful accomplishment. Healthy self-determination. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. And the other piece of that is, is because you are still dealing with health issues. You know, you have things that are a part of your life. You have to put yourself first. You really do. But even sometimes other people who might have health issues, they still don't put themselves first, you know, in the ways that are meaningful. Oh yeah, I've witnessed that um, in close proximity of of not even wanting to slow down when your body is saying like, I'm in distress. And it's always like putting other people first and one, and I get that, I get that impulse. I get it completely. If you're if you're taught that way, and I was taught that way, like you show up for the collective, you show up for your family, you take care of the communal, like that is your job. That is your responsibility is to show up for other people. It becomes very easy to do that and neglect yourself over time. And then I, of course, and me starting to wonder like, and why don't I feel well? Because I wasn't taking care of myself. And in any way, 
that would have an impact on my ability to feel better. I literally was not taking care of myself and my body paid the price for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Another comment from Laura. She's a regular here. Tremendous conversation. This should go viral. Not just for y'all, not only for young ladies, but for some of us older ones still dealing with this concept. That is so true. That is so true. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love having these conversations and why I don't mind saying how old I am, because the reality of it right. is no matter how old you are, you can still learn something and glean something and you can always strive to do better, be better for yourself. You know, because, you know, if I'm not that for me, I definitely don't even have it to give to someone else. That's right. You can't pour from an empty cup. It's not can, possible. That cannot pour from an empty cup. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about, because she is a plus size girl who stays in the media for a multitude of reasons, and that's Lizzo. Yeah, <laughs> you, do, you do mention her in the book as well and kind of watching her and how, how she navigates being her full, fully fabulous self in the world in which we live and how you have people who really love her and admire her. But then she also gets a lot of hateration in the dancery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so talk a little bit about, you know, your, your take on Lizzo and her journey. I am a huge Lizzo fan. I'll say that up front. I'm a huge Lizzo fan. I love that she is just a disruption by just existing. Like she's not doing to me having, and I'm I'm a big fan of, of R&B and pop and like black people in those spaces and black women in those spaces. To me, she doesn't do anything different than say Janet Jackson mm -hmm. in her prime or say Beyonce like very early on, like Beyonce has evolved as an artist as well, but um, very early on the way in which they approach their craft and the way in which they show up in the world, she's not doing anything different. The difference is the fact that she's a plus size woman and she's unapologetically herself. Mm -hmm. It seems as if whenever Lizzo is trending in relationship to her body, whether it's her wearing an outfit to a basketball game that people don't approve of or her having um, these plus size dancers who were dressed as angels in one of her videos that mm -hmm. she was trending about at a point, it all comes from this place of she's not supposed to do that and be that. If mm -hmm. you're going to be a fat person in public view, you're supposed to be continuously losing weight. It's okay if you gain it as long as you're losing it. You're supposed to be continuously losing weight and shrinking yourself to conform to our ideal. The fact that she's unwilling to do that, that she's like, I am who I am. You can accept me or not, but I'm going to show up as my full self all the time. People cannot handle it. They melt down around Lizzo by, from her just simply existing. And we're also not taught to think of her as like a sex symbol mm. or a really attractive star who's worthy of being on the cover of magazines. Like she's supposed to be hidden in the background somewhere, no spotlight on her. And the fact that she resists that so heavily and like steps in and she celebrates and she's joyful and she's proud about her self image and promotes good self esteem. Literally our society is not built to handle that. Right, because they expect her to shrink you know, literally and figuratively. Uh, she's not supposed to be confident because that's a word that gets thrown around when you have a plus size woman who shows up as her full self and is unafraid and, you know, up and relentless about being who she is. Like, oh, you're so confident. Like, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, larger than a size um, four, you're, you're not supposed right. to be confident. That's right. That's right. And it's not just Lizzo who has experienced that. Um, I talk in the book about Missy Elliott, for instance, mm -hmm. who was boxed in that same way. And on the flip side of that, Missy Elliott, who was a genius, literally, as a producer and a songwriter and a performer and this um, this visuals visionary in terms of the way that she crafted music videos, sung a lot and raps a lot about intimacy and mm -hmm. sex and being in relationship with people. And instead she's framed as like this asexual star who shouldn't be perceived as looked at, thought of as attractive because at a point in time she was plus size. And that's just the way, like it's just the, the flip side of that coin of what Lizzo experience is experiencing. Either you're punished for being too out there 
in the way that Lizzo is punished for being too out there, or you're like pushed away and shoved away into this box, into this like asexual, you're not, and, and there's nothing wrong being asexual, but in Missy's case, like this asexual pop star who is never in relationships, nobody cares about the way she looks, all we care about is her mind. It's like two sides of the same coin. Mm. And the crazy thing is somebody say mammy, yep, the mammy trope that people um, like to throw on someone like Missy. But what's so crazy about it is Missy hasn't been a plus size girl for a very, very long, long time. time. But about people still, yeah, but people still look at her in that same way. You know, that no one you don't hear people saying, Oh, Missy is beautiful and talented. It's just talented. <laughs> you know. Right. That's right. And I think some of that has to do with her skin complexion. I think some of it had to do with the size of her former body. I think some of it has to do with the way that she was positioned as a star where that was, you know, like they, they didn't play up the way that she looked. But the reason being is that they didn't think people would be welcoming of it. And Lizzo was proof that they're not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Um, just... Thinking about and the facts of people who lose weight, because that's something that you talk about in your book as well. There's so many things. It's like you have someone like an Adele who loses weight, um, you know, because of certain things that she's dealt with in her life that have led her to feel like she has to come up with a coping mechanism, so to speak. But other people just, oh, look at her. She looks so great now. She's so beautiful now. Adele has been gorgeous for a long time. Right. Like, let's not pretend. I was mad that she won the album of the year of Beyonce too, but Adele is always. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> she's always been a gorgeous woman. I think the way that so the way that I frame this in the book for myself is that I lost a significant amount of weight as a result of my heart failure. I'm not a skinny person by any means, but I'm much smaller than I used to be as a result of the medications that I take, the the diet that they put me on, the liquid restriction that I'm I'm on, I lost a significant amount of weight. And the response I got to that was, you look so good. I had someone who I know who's close to me, and I don't believe I put this in the book, but who said to me, like, if that's what heart failure does to you, I want heart failure too. Um, it doesn't, so what it reinforced to me is that it really doesn't matter how you lose weight as long as you do it. Like the end goal is the goal. It doesn't matter how it's achieved. It doesn't matter if it's something you wanted to do or that you were pursuing. As long as ultimately you become smaller, it was worth it. And we see that with Adele, who was open in her interview with Oprah and saying that she was fine with her body. She started exercising because she was going through a divorce and it really frayed her nervous system. She was dealing with a lot of anxiety. So she was working out with a personal trainer to regulate her nervous system. And as a consequence of that, she her body became smaller. But what people hear is, well, if a divorce is what it takes, then... It, it's worth going through all that heartache if the end result is you losing weight. Hmm. Yeah, that and that's unfortunate. But we are so hell bent, <laughs> or there's a you know a group of people who are so hell bent on number one policing other people's bodies, but also policing them in such a way that there's only one ideal, and we just know that such is not the case. That's never going to be the case. We're always going to have different bodies. And to be put in a situation where, oh, we don't care how you lose it as long as you lose it, you know, that's not that's not positive at, at all. So I'm hoping that as some of you are watching, if these are thoughts that go through your head or things that you may say at different times to people, just be mindful of the impact that that, that has on someone. You know, just one thing to lose the weight or release the weight by a choice but it's another thing that, you know, because you've gotten sick, because I have a relative like that, that she um, has lost over 200 pounds, but it's because she has health issues. You yeah. know, and some people will look at her and say, oh, wow, look, you lost all this weight. But, you know, those of us who are close to her know that, mm, yeah, she lost the weight, but at what cost? That's right. That's right. I, I say all the time, if I had to choose between the body I'm in now and my body pre-heart failure, I would take that body any day of the week and not, 
you know, be on medications that that do all sorts of things to your body over time and not be supremely tired and not have a heart that wasn't functioning the way that it should have functioned. Um, I'd much rather have that pre-body than this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. And just the whole thing of thinking about, let's just talk about it, put it out there, losing weight. Yes. <laughs> There are a lot of ways that, you know, once upon a time, you mentioned in the book, you know, talk about there was a time of video vixens where everybody wanted to have, you know, a Jessica Rabbit type of shape, yeah. you know, with the breast and the small waist and the big hips. Um, of course, we still see that in a lot of Instagram models now, but a lot of what we're seeing isn't real. It's not real. That's what I really want people to get is when they when when you're when you see instagram models who i love right like i i love that black women are able to use that platform to monetize for themselves and make money based on their aesthetic right if kim kardashian can do it they should be able to do it too and i'm i'm clear about that and also when they're promoting these teas and these waist trainers and these lollipops and all of these different things that if you do this you will look like me it is not true. They have surgeons, they have nutritionists, they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for surgery. They have personal trainers. Sometimes it's genetics. It's not as simple as take drink this laxative tea and you'll look like me. But that's what's peddled on, on social media by these women of you can look like me if you do this. And that's just not reality. That's not true. And I want us to move to a place where we recognize that everybody's body is different and our bodies change over time. That's a normal, natural thing to happen as we get older. Your body is going to evolve. It's going to change. That is a normal thing to happen. And trying to chase the size you were 20 years ago is really robbing some of us of our ability to live our full lives as we are right now. And that it's important to recognize like every day is a gift. That That's something that chronic illness has taught me, especially when I was really sick, like really, really sick in the beginning. It's like every day I get to wake up above ground is a good day. It's a blessing. It's a good day to live as my full self today. And I don't need to wait to lose 20 pounds or wait to be the size I was when I was 18 to be okay today in the body that I'm in today. And that it, this, these systems are really designed to rob you of your joy. And that joy is one of the best things that we can hold on to and that we can have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As you were saying, that, that made me think of something that my mother always says to me, because if I look at my, you know, reading your book has caught me, caused me to look at my own trajectory over the years of, you know, a time of being younger to where I am now. And, you know, over the span of my life, adult lifetime, there is about 160 pound range mm -hmm. from the lowest to the highest. And recently I was looking at some photos that someone sent me where I was like, really skinny. And I'm looking like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I don't like the way I look. <laughs> you know, you know, and but to some people, I may have looked healthy, but I wasn't because I had gone through some things that caused me to get to that, you know, lowest of all time weight, just as though there have been things that have led to me being at my highest of all time weight. So for me at this point, I don't have a desire to be that little skinny person anymore who looks like she's sick. <laughs> for me, it's just a thing of finding the happy medium. And I think that that's what's important for all of us. Um, just And I said that to share this next comment that, yes, we agree that preconception state, but we do appreciate that health is vital. Health is a vital consideration. Accepting size should not be a license to do whatever and ignore health. Larger women can be healthy and large. That's and right. that is true. So and true. we should not ignore our health. So in my own personal quest, it is because I want to be healthy, because I am aging, as we all do. And I realize that there are little aches and pains I'm probably going to get anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I could be exacerbating them by carrying more weight. 
So I want my choice is to release some of the weight so that I can continue to thrive and, you know, feel healthy and feel good and maybe lessen some of the effects of things that might happen just simply because I'm aging. Right. I'm, and I'm in, a, I'm in agreement with that. I believe that everyone should do what is best for their body. So I'm very upfront. Like I, I can only have 2000 milligrams of sodium a day. That's it. That means if anything falls outside of that realm, if it's too high, I can't have it. That is a diet. That is, it's a diet designed to preserve my life and ensure that my medications have their maximum impact um, to keep me here as long as humanly possible. But it is a diet and it's a necessary diet to preserve my health. What I found through, through developing both heart failure and pulmonary hypertension, what I've developed, um, what I've discovered through that is that if I pay really, really close attention to my body, it tells me what it needs. Mm -hmm. Truly, I was just saying to my partner, I've had salad two days in a row, but I needed to have salad because I wasn't feeling well. And my, mm -hmm. I, I was like, I just need something, I need greens. If I listen really closely to my body, to every ache, to every pain, to, to what's happening in my gut and in my stomach, to my bowel movements, to just, you know, if I eat certain things, I don't feel well after. If I pay really close attention to my body, it tells me what it needs. I don't have to guess. And that's a, a beautiful place to be in of, I don't need to guess whether I need a salad. I'm listening like, oh yeah, I need a salad today. Mm -hmm. Like my, my gut is not in a good place. I'm not feeling good after I'm eating, say, a burger. Sometimes I have burgers, but I'm not, I'm not feeling well after eating this. I'm going to balance it out with something. Those are the sort of calculations that you can make on an individual level so that you do feel your best. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing that because that's so true. Sometimes I think that when you bring up the whole thing of, you know, loving the skin that you're in or being proud of your body or, you know, some of the other terms that you might see, um, body positivity and all of that, it may lead people to think that you're saying, oh, you should never try to do anything to improve yourself. But there are those times where you might have to. Right. And I don't exist in those extremes. Mm -hmm. Right. I really don't. I don't exist in those extremes. I think people have to do what is best for them. And what I'm trying to do is like raise awareness about the kind of larger system that we're interacting with and that we're coming up against over and over again, the ways that it affects us. But ultimately, I'm of the mind that people should do what is best for them and for their bodies. Like nobody knows your body better than you do. Nobody is a better steward of your body than you are. Like, you know what it is that you need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We know. We know what we need. <laughs> Or we should know or get to a place where we do know what we need, because I think of stories of people that I uh, have heard that have had to change like you have had to change their diet because maybe something did happen and they had to change the way they had to make lifestyle changes because of whatever was going on with them. So but I think the larger thing that I get from your work and from the book is just because you may be in a larger body for you know, a lifetime or a period of time does not give anyone the right to mistreat you, to not listen to whatever things you may be sharing with them when it comes to, you know, going to a physician or, you know, treating you differently in the workplace or whatever the case may be, that you should not be mistreated or discriminated against or dismissed because of the size of your body. Right. And that happens far more often than we think it does. I say all the time, we still think of fatness as a choice. So the ways in which we've come around as a society about, say, racism, right? For the most part, if you are like an out and out racist, there are social consequences for that. For the most part, depends on where you are, of course, in terms of class. But if you are an out and out racist, there are social consequences for that. You get ostracized, you get exiled, you um, lose your job. We saw a woman lose her dog. I mean, all mm -hmm. sorts of things happen if you are out and out and out racist. If you're an out and out fat phobic person, right, who mistreats people because mistreats people because their body is bigger than yours or believe that that person like correlate their fatness with laziness, for instance, and you don't promote them at work because of the size of their body outside of the state of Michigan, that's perfectly legal. 
You can do that and there are no consequences for mm -hmm. it. And that's what I'm trying to raise awareness about is the ways that we mistreat fat people in our society because we still think of fatness as just in the realm of choice. Like you can choose to lose weight and this won't happen to you. But also I should be able to go to work and not be discriminated against. Like that should should be just baseline for all of us. Mm -hmm. Or one of the things she talked about, I should be able to get on an airplane and have be able to sit comfortably without having to buy another seat, <laughs> you know, right. things like that, or, you know, get on certain rides at the amusement park or whatever. One of the things I was thinking about um, as you, in, at that part of the book, I know I enjoy horseback riding and there was a place mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to go to once. And it clearly said, if you weigh above this, the horse don't want you on. <laughs> I mean, oh. <laughs> I didn't say that, but it was basically, it was basically like, if you weigh over X amount of pounds, please don't come here trying to ride our horses. So yeah, I mean, it's it's things like that that yeah, people get discriminated against. Yeah, and it becomes. I, I'm still like a very fortunate person in that like, yes, I'm plus size, but I can still go into stores and buy clothes. I can still fit in a single seat on an airplane. Most places I go to, like if I go to the amusement park now, it's not a big deal for me to get on a ride, et cetera. But it, the larger that you get, the smaller your world is. Mm. So if you're say 200 pounds larger than I am right now, you can't fit in, in a seat at a restaurant. You can't go horseback riding. You can't go to an amusement park. You can't fit on an airplane comfortably. People may point at you and laugh at you or take videos of you to shame you. If all of that's happening, like a lot of, of people who become that size are just isolated in their homes. And that's not right either. That's not the way in which we should approach that in our society. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And thank you so much for, for talking about that because it's true. So it's a lot about the treatment and allowing people the right to decide what's right for them and their bodies and not trying to shame or police them because you don't like it. Because that, that's one of the things, another thing that came to mind as I was reading, or oh, somebody says camping chairs or folding chairs. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, you know, yes, yeah, certain things when you go to purchase, if you're a person of size, you look and be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want to waste my money on it and not and have, you know, not be able to have it not work for me. So that that's something that's true. But um just wanted to talk about it real briefly. You talk about the fashion. For example, there are people who will say, oh, well, so-and-so shouldn't wear this or so-and-so shouldn't wear that. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to go on a cruise and I decided I was going to wear a hot pink bikini. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody say to me, oh, wow, you're really brave to wear that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, really? What is such an insult? That yeah, insult. it really is. You know, you're really brave to wear that. But it's like, you know what? I'm going to wear my hot pink bikini. <laughs> you know, last year I decided that, you know, I was going to do a boudoir fashion shoot, not for anybody but myself. So mm -hmm. I got my sexy lingerie and I went and took my pictures. <laughs> and nice. it was a wonderful experience. And I did it in my larger body because I was like, you know what? It, I, it proves to me that no matter what, I'm still sexy. I still, well, even if somebody else doesn't look at me and think that, I know that I'm still a beautiful woman. I'm still a curvaceous woman. I'm still all of these things. But I believe that there are times when others may judge or have negative things to say because of their own biases. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think fashion is like ground zero for that. Of uh, The thing that... And I, I am the friend in like my friend group where they're like, I met this plus size woman who is not confident. I'm going to introduce her to you mm -hmm. and like show her how to dress, show her how to like show up in the world. And what I found with that is like on one end is really helpful because it's like I'm, I'm fortunate that I grew up like my best friend is a plus size woman. Our friendship group, there are different plus size women. So I never felt like the only one. I always felt like I had kind of comrades in the struggle of like figuring it out, like figuring out what to wear and how to wear it. But what I found is if you're not perfectly camouflaging every part of yourself, that is what you get. Like, oh, it's very brave that you wore that. Couldn't be me. 
is is the the flip side of that coin, right? Like it's like a backhanded compliment. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you're so confident. Where do you get your confidence from? It couldn't be me. Is the the backhanded part of that? Mm-hmm. And like, fashion is really ground zero for that. But I always say that people should mind their own bodies. Mind your own body and what's happening with you and and how you feel about yourself. But you can't project your feelings about how you would feel if you were plus size on someone who actually is, who's just trying to live, who's just trying to step out into the world every day with their confidence intact, with their humanity intact, their dignity intact. Like if you have something negative to say, it like goes back to the age old adage. If you have something bad to say, say nothing at all. Like that's an instance where that applies. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Our time is almost up, believe it or not, but it's been so wonderful to speak to you after reading your book and just hearing you talk about things and sharing your experiences. And thank you for everyone watching who had comments and things to add to the conversation, because this is an important thing for us to talk about. Just you know, remembering who we are in the bodies that we are and that they're all beautiful in their own ways and that we should be loved and appreciated for that. That's right. So is there anything else that you would like to share with us before you go that maybe I didn't bring up that you want to make sure that we take away from Weightless or encourage someone to read Weightless? Yeah, the only thing I would say is this is an adult book. I would not recommend giving it to children because there are some adult contents, but I would recommend sharing the lessons from it with children, Um, particularly because kids are having a hard time. They're having a hard time post. Well, we're still in the pandemic, but, you know, they're back in school with all the social media, just encouraging children to take the lessons of this book and apply it to themselves, especially young black girls. Is, is so important to me that they know that they are perfectly fine the way they exist right now. There's nothing they need to change about themselves. Like they are good the way that they are. All right. And we will end on that note. What besides, are there any other things that you have coming up that we can be on the lookout for soon, whether it's events or the next thing that you might be working on since I know that you are a writer by trade? I'm a writer by trade. This is true. Um, I'm doing another event tomorrow around this same time at Loyalty Bookstores in Maryland. Um, so that is happening tomorrow. And then I'm in the new year, I'm coming to both Tulsa and Tucson. So Tulsa, Oklahoma, Tucson, Arizona in person to do events. So just look out for that. And then, of course, I'm always writing other books and always focus on Black women in my work. All right. Sounds good. And of course, her social media um, handles have been scrolling so you can pick those up and be able to follow along with what she's got going on so i heard your puppy in the back barking a little earlier <laughs> oh he's probably upset because he's not with me he's, he's mad he's <laughs> mad so i'm gonna turn you back over to your family and i'm gonna make a couple of quick announcements here but thank you again yvette i look forward to talking to you again this definitely will not be the last time because i enjoyed speaking with you and you have so much to share with us all and we really appreciate it Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. All right, everybody. So as I mentioned, that was my last interview for the year. So I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk to Yvette and just learn more about her work, Weightless, and just really to think about some things that maybe we don't always give a lot of thought behind because some of us have already been around family members and, you know, maybe said something that we shouldn't have or maybe seeing family members. So it's just cause to think about some of the environments that we may go into, the things that we say to others, or sometimes, you know, being able to check somebody (laughs) in a nice way if they say something to us that may be hurtful. So I really appreciate it. I would do Hope that you go ahead and pick up a copy of Weightless because there's so much in here that we didn't get a chance to get into that I think would be beneficial. So by means of announcement, next week, I am going to be doing a special edition, not really um, interviewing anyone, but basically BGC Book Club's Lit Year in Review. So what I'm going to do is come on and actually tomorrow you will see Um, on social media, and if you're subscribed to the um, Bronco Collective email list, you will see a 
a survey that you can fill out to kind of talk about what our favorite books were of the year and things like that. And then next Monday, I will come on during our normal time and share some of what our best experiences, favorite books, things like that for the year. And that will be it until we come back in on 2023. Oh, no, actually, that won't be it. I have one other event that I will be doing this Thursday in conjunction with um, Unerased Black Women Speak is Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, I'll post, I'll put up the actual flyer um, as I'm going offline, but it's going to, I will be interviewing the author of Black Joy and also talking to a, um, a bibliotherapist who basically prescribes books to people who are going through different therapeutic um, situations, as well as have us do a brief meditation that talks about joy. So be on the lookout for that this coming Thursday at seven o'clock. It will stream on Unerased Black Women Speaks page, but it will also be streamed on Brown Girl Collective. So you don't have to go and look for it. So that's all I have for now. And until either Thursday or next week, you all take care and have a good one. We'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.